Welcome to the podcast, the destination for insightful discussions and interviews on the appreciation, conservation, and husbandry of reptiles with a focus on turtles and tortoises. Now, let's join our team of turtle nerds. Hello, everyone. And welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast. I don't know if you just heard Minto calling me mean. Apparently, I'm also mean to him off air. My, I would always say that I'm not mean to him off air. That what you mm-hmm. see is just an act, but apparently that's not true because I was just mean to him before we came on here. But welcome. We're very excited to have you here with us for episode number 64. 64 episodes. It's crazy when you do it every month and you miss several months for different reasons over the years, but we're excited to be here. We're excited to have our awesome guest. First, we have Kevin Minto. Say hi, Kev. Hey, guys. Say hey, goodnight, Kevin. And everybody. I right, see you guys later. That, that was from uh, Home Alone. Home Alone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Awesome. And we have Chris Leone with us. Hi, Chris. Hi. Hi. Everyone's favorite Hi. turtle heartthrob. Steve Enders is in the background. Hi, Steve. And we've got our wonderful esteemed guest from Greg's Turtle Haven, Greg Brashear, coming live from Georgia. You're in Georgia right now, right? Yeah. Okay, I just want to. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> make sure you weren't like you know traveling or something during you know during the pandemic and yeah. Uh, you actually were sitting in Georgia right now. So when you're telling us like where you're sitting and how things are here, we know actually what's going on. But um, it's it's awesome to have you on the show. We're excited. I feel like it's a really long time coming because um, you've been kind of a friend of the show for a long time. So it's really cool to have you here and be able to spend some time with you and everything. So welcome. Yeah, it's kind of like the, the whole long-time listener, first-time caller thing. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And, and we appreciate it a lot. Um, Kevin, you had a question first that you wanted to ask for Greg. Yeah, Greg. So we are both old, long-time skateboarders. Uh, what, do you think this is like a, a small little niche group? Like, can we find more people around the world? Yeah, I Skateboarders mean, and turtle lovers? Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's, I mean, there's more skaters that are into, I mean, herps in general. But I mean, there's, I mean, Anthony Furlong has a collection of like Black Mountain tortoises. Brandon Beagle really? has, I think, a Russian tortoise. Oh, uh, yeah, Colin McKay has like a Sulcata. Yep, yep. Um, and I know, like my my buddy Jamie, like his kids are into reptiles, and his son like follows my Instagram, and I I think they would want turtles, but I think where they live, I don't, I don't think it works for them. But mm-hmm. th- I think there is something in, in skateboarders that um definitely can kind of i don't know if it's that obsessiveness is the same obsessiveness that mm-hmm. people get with turtles but um there's definitely a parallel there yeah also like i don't know i don't know if it's the same for you but like you, you look at things differently when you when you're a skateboarder you know you just you didn't start skating like you you were supposed to be a skateboarder because of the way you see stuff you know you can't do that with baseball or hockey it just d- doesn't work the same so for me, I think if you have that that different mindset, it allows you to see other animals besides cats and dogs as something that's of interest as a kid too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Like, like the, the same way, like when I would go around looking for something to skate, like I would see like a set of stairs, a rail, a ledge, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. It's the same way, like I'll drive around and I'll see like a creek that just has all the right stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a juicy little spot, you know, and I'll go like <laughs> hop a fence or, you know, cut a gate or something and, and get in there. So yeah. I think that, there's a little bit of that, a little bit of that that also parallels it. And um, the skaters are just really obsessive and perceptive. So I think that mm-hmm. it works. Awesome. I love that. I love that. That's what I was going to ask too, is not so much with the way you train your eye over time because of your interest, but is there something to be said about, like, you have to have a certain maturity level to say, yeah, I really don't care about being cool anymore because I'm going to like turtles and that's going to be like my thing. And like when people ask me about my biggest hobby or what I like to do on the weekends or whatever, like I'm confident enough to be like, yeah, man, I like turtles. Like I don't need to have to feel any pressure to be anything else. And I'm, I wonder about like a high school kid who's into skating and you guys can speak to this more than I could, but like you have to have a certain level of like not caring what others think on some level like no this is what i like doing and i'm just gonna go do it and absolutely does that make sense mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's yeah. what i that's what i deal with with or what i dealt with with music <laughs> you know 
couldn't exactly go on stage and say, so I want to talk to you guys about turtles and, you know, instead <laughs> of getting to this next song, you know, but you know, well, we're all- where music is different is that like, you know, people get into a band because they want girls to like them. But yeah, no, that, you know? yeah, yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah. Neither one worked. <laughs> back, back when I was skating, the turtles whoa. got me the girl. <laughs> gotcha. Back when I was skating in like the late '80s and early '90s, which is like when I got really into skating, it was also around the same time I was really, really into turtles, and so it was like skating wasn't cool back then. There wasn't Tony Hawk games. There wasn't like X Games. Like. Skating was like super whack, especially in the South. Like you were gonna get picked on, you were gonna get beat up just for saying you did it. So then, like, what what more is it to say you like turtles on top of that? You know, I was yeah. like, so when I was in school, I was all I was always picked on because I like turtles and reptiles and animals. So then to like throw skating on top of that, it was just like the little cherry on top. And then, you know, you weren't you weren't getting girls and for skating either. And so for me, the the two just have always been hand in hand with my my entire life and it's funny to see that like around the same time that skateboarding got cool was also around the same time that reptiles kind of became more accessible over the internet with kingsnake.com and different forums coming and going and having classifieds and so you started to see people expand their taste and pets and turtles and reptiles became a big thing in the early to mid 2000s and that's when skateboarding also became cool so it went from kind of being a dorky thing to like then all of a sudden it's it's almost like a cool thing and music ha- had a lot to do with, you know, or at least some to do with skating becoming, you know, cool, you know, with, with Tony Hawk, you know, with, with all the bands that he featured on his games and stuff like that. So it's, it's funny how like it, the whole thing, you know, is oh, yeah. all that, all that, um, that old punk rock and all that punk rock that oh, was yeah. used in those games. I mean, that's the stuff that I grew up listening to, you know, yeah. and, you know, they were bands that. Uh, all the mainstream kids had never heard of you know i was in high school and kids back then like like 311 and um i don't know like smashing pumpkins or something which mm-hmm. it, I, I appreciate smashing pumpkins now but at the time i thought they were super whack because i was yeah. really in minor threat and I yeah i like, <laughs> get that yep <laughs> now if if i want to take that a step further one of the re- one of the reasons i'm really excited to have you as a guest is um, that even your turtle interests are kind of multifaceted. So we talked about how kind of your nerddom spans different subjects, but then even just on, on a more micro level, your turtle interests span several different areas. And, and what I'm getting to there is your work in the field and at your own home, keeping animals in captivity. And you're probably the most 50-50 split person that, or one of the most that I know um, which I think is really interesting. So can you speak to that a little bit? Like when you were when you were younger, like what interested you more keeping or searching uh, for? Yeah, so um, I mean, it, it, I can't really say which interested me more when I was younger, um, mostly because I'm getting to the age where I can't remember a lot. But um, <laughs> when I was a kid, the neighborhood I lived in in Florida, there wasn't like a lot of other kids to play with. And so it was like, if I couldn't take like my skateboard over to another street and skate ramps, the older kids weren't skating when they weren't there. It was like me and my brother, my mom would pack backpack lunches. And we, I had like Peterson's field guides and Audubon field guides and I'd throw those in there. And me and my brother would go out with like bologna sandwiches and we would just roam like palmetto thickets. Um, there was a river called the Sebastian River. We would get down in there. Uh, we would look for ponds, ditches, canals, and we would just catch stuff all day long, every day, and just look it up in the field guide. And it was just like this little mental like list I was making of just finding stuff and, and looking up and reading about it and saying like, okay, this is the habitat. I know that that's way over this way, right? So then I would go try and find it. And um, I think it just kind of set me up then by doing that so young to be really into field herping and looking for things. And then that way, once I started keeping things a lot, I remember by the time I'd probably set up three or four aquariums at my house, I started really not being satisfied with what I was setting up because it didn't look the way the wild stuff looked. And then as time went by, I started figuring out it was better to do it outside. And then like, okay, well, I want more plant life in there because the places I go have a lot of plant life. And I want Hmm. logs jammed in there because when I find snappers, they like to jam under a log and they look so much happier that way. You know, it is, I set myself up to be this like psychopath that has to do have a, have one foot in the field and one foot in 
captivity and, and do it. I, I get your sickness, man. I, yeah, one hundred percent. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Keep going, please. <laughs> so yeah, so I I try to spend three or four days a week. Right. I mean, right now I don't have a job. When I came back from Thailand in March, um, I'm a wedding photographer and videographer, and um, all the weddings got pushed. Yeah. And um, so right now I have like a lot of time. So I've been building my YouTube channel and um, I try to do every single Friday field herping videos. So I, I'm trying to spend three or four days a week right now in the field, you know, to some degree, you know, I count my clips and what I've got. And if it's something that's tangible and interesting, um, my last one I did on Swanee alligator snappers. And I think what I want to do moving forward is try and focus on a species each Friday. So yeah, I'm leaving it like, four or five in the morning tomorrow to go to South Georgia to, to do it for two days. So that's great. Like that, With, psycho. Within your surrounding States, roughly, you know, how many species of turtles can you come in contact with? Uh, Georgia 26, Alabama, I think is 30 um, something. Florida is, I don't know, just whatever Florida has. Yeah. You can um, get this going for a while then. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Alabama is probably the best, the single best state there is though. I mean, you can get literally anything in Alabama. I thought if we were, if, if you're looking at taxa in terms of species and subspecies, that Alabama was up near 40 and that that was the yeah. most, the uh, most diverse, 40? yeah, that, that Alabama was the most diverse turtle state in the country. Wow, it look is. at that. I, that's something I actually never knew. Wow. I think Texas is right behind. Okay. Is it? Okay, cool. Oh. oh. Yeah. Steve Alabama. just said uh, <laughs> Alabama, Florida, Texas in that order. That's so awkward. That's so awkward. <laughs> From the ghost behind the scenes. Oh, man. I love it. So uh, what do you guys suppose are the reasons, like, those states? Like, what what causes that? Uh, river systems and geologic, just kind of geologic layout. I mean, um, Alabama has the Coosa, the, like, it's got all that mobile drainage, but the way those drainages are staggered out over the state, it, it like, kind of fans out. And so it brings in, um, you know, like Black Warrior and Black Warrior obviously has uh, things like the flattened musk. And then you, um, it's got like, you know, your black knob maps. Uh, I, I think even the map turtles make up like such a large bulk of it. And then you get down to the coast and then, you know, they got diamondback terrapins. And, uh, I was going to say, you know, you're bringing the map turtles and the cooters and sliders into it. You know, you, you now you've really just naturally you've got a high number of different animals, you know. Right. So, so you talked about bringing what you're finding in the field to what you're doing in captivity um you talked about snappers when you were mentioning that what um what species were you i assume that when you were younger since you were out in the wild so much uh you were taking some animals home, which is okay. We've all done it back when we were kids, right? Oh, yeah. But um, so, was it just snappers or other things at a young age as well? Well, uh, the, you know, the funny thing with snappers was, is like I was catching just about everything else, um, and I wasn't even really catching snappers in Florida, even though they were everywhere. I would always come really close to catching them and lose them in the mud because uh, Florida doesn't have clear water down there; it just turns to like black goo. So they were always like my white whale. And so I was always reading in my field guides and my turtle books and um, reading about alligator snappers and common snappers and at the time Florida snappers. And I was just obsessed with them and I'd always go looking for them. But by virtue of looking for them, I'd come into contact with all the musk turtles, mud turtles, soft shells, cooters. And where I lived it, at that time, it had so many empty lots that indigo snakes and gopher tortoises were common. You would see them every single morning if you got up early enough. So like by the time I moved up to Georgia, people made such a big deal about indigos and gopher tortoises. I thought that was funny because I was like, oh, those are just whatever. And then now I went back, I actually went back there in December and the whole neighborhood's completely different and they're all gone. But um, I would, so yeah, Florida box turtles, gopher tortoises, all that stuff were an everyday thing. Um, but snappers, it was like, just like this obsession. And it was like something that I always look for. And I would always get jealous because I go to like summer camp and some kid would find one and it wouldn't be me. And it would just make me obsess even more. Like, oh, i got to figure it out. And then I think I took a trip to Kentucky at my family farm. And they're common snappers like you won't believe in Kentucky because they just hop from those farm ponds. 
Mm -hmm. And they just grow huge. And I remember I I figured out how to find them and the way they bury in the mud and the tracks they leave. And um, just seeing the way that they would find places to wedge up in things, I thought that was so cool. And um, that just kind of triggered a a whole whole thing. And so by the time I got my first snapping turtles, I was like, okay, I have to make, you know, those little layers that they like. And and, and I was doing that um, with pretty much everything by that point. That's great. Greg, have you ever, um, have you been up this way to Herp at all and seen the snapping turtles appear or no? No, I have not. I've, I've heard that they're way bigger up there and I really want to see them. Well, but. Uh, the reason I asked you that is because, you know, you're not the first person that I've heard say that the ones from Kentucky and other regions are huge, that they're hopping from farm pond to farm pond. But, um, you know, up here I've, I've seen really massive ones or what I, what I think are massive. And then there's a lot of what I, I'm not impressed with their size that are, you know, um, just the other day, I, I wish I, I should have thought to send this to Steve to use because we were going to be talking about snapping turtles tonight, but just the other day we were out in, in the area seeing if our terrapins were starting yet. And we came across a female snapper nesting and, um, they're, they're significantly smaller, you know, from what, what I've seen in other areas. And I, I'm not, you know, I have not seen snapping turtles in many different areas, but I was out in Minnesota and got to see them out there. And I, from what I could tell, they were significantly larger than what we have here. But, you know, going back to childhood, there, there was a lot of famous stories growing up of these, like, you know, snapping turtles that could kill you, you know what I mean? Cause they were yeah. so big, you know, and we would, you know, the kids would be telling stories about them in the neighborhood and, and, you know, me and my few buddies that eventually grew out of their turtle obsession, I did not, uh, we would go to these duck ponds and, and try to look for Brutus, the, the elusive snapping turtle that could eat your golden retriever in one bite, you know, and we never came across them, but then you would hear that somebody caught him and you would get jealous, you know? And, um, so that was just a general curiosity because I'm, I'm very into locality specifics and stuff. And I was curious if, you know, are they larger up North? Like that usually how that usually happens or are they larger down South? You know? Um, I mean, I can only speak to where I've been and throughout most of Georgia, they're pretty small. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the, in the scheme of common snapping turtles, most are about 13 to 14 inches full grown, you know, for a big one. But when you get into the Flint and Suwannee river systems, I noticed, and I've seen somebody publish on this, that when you get into river systems that have the alligator snapping turtles, the common snappers get bigger. Mm. And all the biggest ones I've ever caught were in places where I find alligator snappers. Um, it's, I, I think it's an evolution good. thing where they, they know what they have to compete with, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and, and it seems that they need to be bigger um to kind of coexist and then the other places i've seen some of the biggest ones are in the florida springs but going back to people talking about meeting a dog i was uh herping by myself in a lake next to my parents neighborhood when i was 13 or 14 probably and um i was looking along the edge for like musk turtles and this little white cat was drinking from the edge of the pond and a common snapper grabbed it by the head dragged it in and drowned it no kidding wow <laughs> so they're they, they capable of it you saw that happen? Yeah, I watched it happen, and that cat stayed stuffed under a log for probably two more weeks after that. Wow. Jeez. With a bunch of missing cat posters all over the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was, uh, it, I, I don't, I hate to say it was pretty cool to see, but, it, you know, it was pretty cool to see. <laughs> hate to say it, but I'll say it. Yeah, yeah you were pointing to your shirt. right now. Yeah, I was. You were pointing to your shirt because yeah. Chris mentioned the Terrapin Conservation Initiative. Is that why? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. you had to you had to drag terrapins into this. We're we, we're gonna have a snapping turtle episode, and you had to bring the terrapins into it. Chris, have, I didn't have they the, started? I didn't write the memo. It, they uh, have not. They have not started. It's normally uh, right now. It could be like tomorrow. Tomorrow's gonna be uh, warmer, right? Here, so it could be tomorrow. Here, here's the deal. You know, we have had probably the worst spring on record up here I, I i cannot believe what just happened casey my wife is going nuts trying to figure out when these things are going to start running uh usually when we see them in the um creek at the end of the road here by the restaurant they um they just uh you know that we saw one in the in the canal or the the creek and that was it you know we're just not really seeing them right now um which is weird because last year they started early on May 29th. Uh, the year before that, they started on June 2nd. And um, I, I just, I have a feeling, I mean, I could be wrong. We could wake up tomorrow and be inundated with them, but I, um, you know, 
the, the, the spring is, was just a mess. It was just too cold for way too long. And, um, I, I know I could be totally wrong and I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's going to be another week, but I'm like calling I, said, I, think I don't know. Tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow? It. Yep. Yep. But the reason I wanted to bring up the shirts and I just asked the question to be nice, but also, I mean, timing, right? Like it's right in the middle of when they should start, um, coming up on land like crazy. Like, the, the South Jersey Arivada that they are, where they all come up to lay their eggs at the same time, um, is that I wanted to give a plug because today we had a new bonfire campaign come out. So this this Terrapin Conservation Initiative t-shirt that we're wearing, and poor Greg didn't get the memo, unfortunately, but that's on, that's on us, Greg. That's not on you, that's on us. Um, this, this shirt did really well. It was really great for our... Um, for the, the Terrapin program, all the proceeds go to that. And we have a new one, uh, a new a new shirt that is coming out today on Bonfire, which is the, which has the Pondcast logo, a new logo um, that we just created. Uh, we're really excited about it. And uh, proceeds will go towards uh, educational work that the, the Turtle Room does. So we're really excited about that. So if you're interested in a cool turtle related shirt that you can't get anywhere else for a radio show that's been out for seven and a half years and has never had a t-shirt, uh, this is your opportunity to do that. So uh, getting back to the conversation, thank you, Greg, for being patient while I went off, uh, veered in the wrong direction for, for a few. Um, so snapping turtles, snapper Greg. Um, what is it about snapping turtles for you that, that just makes them so special? Um, I, I would say like, you know, like most kids, um, you know, I was into dinosaurs and then I think like most people that grow up to be into snapping turtles, like they're, they're just like, for me, the turtle embodiment of a dinosaur. And then I think the more I worked with them and looked for them, they just kind of became, especially the alligator snappers just became so enigmatic that it, it started to feel like there was like a certain, um, groove that you have to be in to, to be able to find them and, and all that stuff. And by the time I'd, I'd started keeping my first alligator snappers, I just was pretty pretty much taken with just everything from the way they look to the way they behave, the way they grew. And um, I felt like they were so misunderstood, especially in the captive keeping world. And that I think a lot of people were getting them and thinking that, you know, they were pet rocks. And at one point I felt that way. And then I started realizing how nocturnal they were. And then um, once I started putting them outside and seeing their behavior at night, you know, they're zipping around and they're alert and they're very bird-like in some of their movements and just fascinating. And then once I was able to kind of learn where they live and figure that out, you know, and started being able to interact with them in the wild and, you know, be able to walk up on a group of three or four of them all feeding at once, that, that was it, man. I was like, this is the thing right here. These are 100% my favorite. And like I said, just misunderstood animals. You know, I, I wanted, I'm happy that you brought it up because that's something I wanted to talk about because I've heard you speak before on your work um, in the wild with them in situ and um, your observations about them being nocturnal. And when you go out to observe and do your field herping for uh, alligator snappers, you're, you're doing the bulk of that at night. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I, I tell most people, if you want to see big ones, don't bother going um, before midnight. Um, their peak activity is around two or three in the morning till about four in the morning. So you got you to gotta be willing to get wet, get beat up, and then drive home tired and stinky. So That's, that's incredible. The payoff is when you walk up on them and that same creek you might have been in the day before during the daytime and you never saw anything, you can walk up and there can be three or four of them right in front of you all just, you know, happily munching away on clams and mussels and, you know, not paying you any mind at all. That's really incredible. So your, you said that your observation, if I, if I heard correctly, though, that's, that's, something that you originally noticed with your captive animals, not in the field. You weren't yeah, just like camping yeah. out and couldn't sleep and discovered it outside. Yeah, I, I think that like most people, when I first got into alligator snappers, the, the snapping turtle part of the name kind of made me think that they were something that they really maybe aren't. And um, I kind of wanted, I, I wanted them to behave more like a common snapper and they just don't, you know, they just don't want to, they don't want to, be in direct sunlight. They don't want to be looked at. They don't want to really interact with anything during the day. They might lure, but that's about as far as it goes. And then um, once I got, actually have it here, best book ever. 
biology and conservation of the alligator snapping turtle, I, you know, you start to learn like, oh, these, they're more active at night. They, the behavior changes. And um, so I, once I started moving them outside and I'd go out at night with a flashlight, which I still do to this day and look at them at night with a flashlight, then all of a sudden they're moving around and they're, they're very quick. Um, they're sweeping their heads from side to side, investigating things and interacting with their environment. And I noticed that in captivity and I was like, well, this has to happen in the wild. And once I started finding them in the wild and started going out at night, it was like, it was like, you know, this is the ticket. And it, it's, it's really interesting to see a turtle that's about a hundred pounds move quickly across the bottom and investigating everything in its, you know, habitat. That's absolutely incredible. Really, really cool. Did you have something, Chris? Sorry, your mouth moving. Oh, you're you're muted. You're muted. Yep, that's why. Am I that's why. Now? Nope, that's why I talked over you though. I'm like, uh. it's like Chris was talking, but he wasn't talking. <laughs> you gotta guess you what I'm saying. You are a professional. Turn your mic on. I I muted it because Steve told me to. He said you sound terrible tonight. Mute it. And that's not what he said. But anyway, I think you sound what, terrific. Sultry. What is the largest alligator snapping turtle that you've come across in nature? Rookie um, question. Rookie so, question. Yeah. It's not a rookie question. I've told a few people this. Um, the The largest I've caught personally is a yellow male that I catch like every single year. And he's around 100 pounds, you know, maybe yeah. give or take, depending on time of year. The largest I've ever seen in the wild. Um, I was at a spot in South Georgia. It's like Suwannee River drainage. And I was looking for Suwannee snappers in like December. And uh, there's like a boat ramp and a big log jam. And there's all kinds of trash and stuff in it. And there was like a whole like um, one of those like little two person paddle boats, you know, yeah. upside down on this log jam. And I'm walking up and down this creek all day looking for them and finding pretty much everything but, you know, snapping turtles. And then so I was like, all right, well, I got a four hour drive back home. So I'm packing everything up, took one last walk down to the water. And that paddle boat was out in the middle of the creek and it wasn't a paddle boat. That was the shell. Oh a wow! The male alligator snapper. He was just like almost like a whitish cream color. Yeah. Head. And what it was is he had just jammed himself in these logs, and because they were so full of trash and the way his shell looked, I just there was no way in my mind I thought that could have been a turtle. And then he just wow. went off into the middle of the creek right at sunset and and took off. That's and, crazy. I mean, I could I don't I couldn't guess a weight. Uh, I mean, over a hundred pounds for sure, but right. Um, you know, sometimes angle of water can like magnify. Stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I, I don't. You I don't know, want to be the. I don't want to be the guy that says he is the size of a Volkswagen. It's it's funny because mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, all of us have come across turtles crossing the road, and I don't know about all you guys, but it's funny. You know, even now with the terrapins, like we, we know what we're up against and, and even, you know, common snappers, eastern muds, eastern painted, red bellies and uh, eastern box that are crossing the road. It, it's this it's similar to the water thing where you see one coming out onto the road and and, and sometimes your reaction reaction is, what is that? You know, it looks <laughs> huge. And then you get to it and it's like not even a mature turtle, you know, yeah, and yeah. it's funny how those how those things work. And it's like, you know. I'd love to get you up here to, to, to see what, what we see. And when these, like Anthony was saying, it's like an Aribata with the Terrapins. And when they start moving onto the road in that morning light, you know, right on the blacktop in the shadow of them, they look like three times the size of what they actually are. And they, they're not a small turtle, a female Terrapin, but still, you know, it's, it's interesting how that works. Yeah. I, I, would, I would love to see that. I've, I've made several trips to look for diamondback terrapins, but I just don't know enough about them to know where to look. I mean, I know there's a, a certain area in coastal Georgia that's good for them. And I think I've seen a head up before and I think I saw one run over one, but I, I don't know time of year. And, you know, the, with the state protection levels, I don't want to be some Yahoo out there like, you know, right. wanting to can like, I finally got them, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I. As far as I, I would either talk to like the Orion Society or maybe Jordan Gray or, you know, come mm -hmm. up and visit you guys. Yeah, Jordan would be a real, yeah, you're welcome to come up here. But uh, yeah, Jordan would be a good one to talk to about in Georgia, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm guessing they're, you know, they're probably a whole, I don't know, maybe two to four weeks earlier than we are. I mean, my wife knows. She can tell you where the Terrapins are nesting 20 years ago, you know. But yeah. um, it's definitely sooner than here, especially after the spring we had. Yeah, most of our stuff is already nested here. I know alligator snappers are usually the last ones nesting, and they're already they already nested last week, and they okay. only they only nest like one time a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of interesting. Usually they nest in the first week of June, but they nested last week, and they've all been. I sent Steve some pictures. Uh, most of the nests were raided. Um, uh, the farm, you know, yeah. like and they, it, you know, you know their nests too because the eggs are so big. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like a common snap or ping pong ball. It's like a big, you know, they got big balls, big eggshells. Yeah. Jeez. Steve's going through All pictures right. right now, just in case you're <laughs> listening to the audio only. Yeah. Um, we got, he's going quickly through pictures. Oh but, man, we got all sorts of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. He's looking for eggs, but he doesn't see them. But uh, me and Grover Brown, uh, a few years ago, we actually met up one time and we found a fresh nest. And the way alligator snappers dig their nests, it's so easy to identify because what they're working so hard with their back feet, they kind of fidget with their forelegs. And those four legs are so big and strong, they dig these two trenches mm. in the front part of the nest. So if you know what you're looking for, you can spot that nest a mile away because you'll just see these two giant trenches and then like a pile of sand with, you know, some, some grass on top. Up here, the, um, the northern red bellies, they, they prefer to nest in clay for whatever reason. And they, uh, at, at least in areas outside the Pine Barrens, they're not going to find clay in the Pine Barrens. But um, it's funny, like as kids, we used to find their nests really easy because you would find the clay plug and it would, it would just stick out like a sore thumb. You would see like a nice grassy, you know, um, raised area where, where the, uh, where the turtles would come up out of the water to, to nest on. And you would just see these like random, it, it looked like you were just you know, playing with red clay and just stuck it on the ground and yeah. you would pull that plug out. And sure enough, there's a full nest of red belly eggs. Um, and so it wasn't a very good disguise and most of them got raided too, you know? Yeah. I know, I know John Richards has said the same thing that happens at his house. He'll go check all his nests when his turtles nest. And he said, it'll just be plugs of grass all over the place. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like they were all raided by you, Chris. Just saying. Yeah. I was hungry, pretty good. So don't judge. <laughs> just, uh, it's gotta be a good omelet. Northern red bellies. I don't know. I couldn't eat a northern red belly. They're too. They're too wonderful. Uh, aren't they? We can't even yeah. joke about it. It like hurts. No, we can't. We both love them too much. They're they're know. you know just like Greg saying with the snappers. They're like an underdog. You know, it's uh, they're you know well whatever. Let's let's we won't. <laughs> we won't. We won't go down that. No, I mean we can go down there if you want. Okay, I think this is a good time to go to our first feature. What do you think? Minto's mailbag. That's right. Sure. Minto's mailbag. That's what she said. <laughs> All right, all right guys. So we so have uh, one question, and it was kind of answered by Steve already, but um, the question is, so the Suwanee snapper is actually considered a subspecies, or are there others? Uh, so it's, they're actually full species. Uh, the paper in 2014 made three species, uh, Macrochiles, uh, Tamenchii, which was already standing, and then it added Apalachicole, which was Flint, Chattahoochee River and Apalachicola River, they're all one drainage. And then Swanaiensis was the um, Suwannee River drainage. So it, the Suwannee River, the Withlacoochee, the Alapaha, and then the Santa Fe down in Florida. And then in 2015, um, a paper came out. Uh, the guy basically said he didn't see enough characters in Apalachicola to warrant full specific status and called it a synonym species of Tamenchii. Um, but me personally, cause I see them all the time. Their Apalachicolas are completely different to me than Tamikia. Their heads are different. The shell is different, but I don't write papers. So I'm know. nerding I, out hard right now. I yeah. Really the, for me, the thing is, is I always call them Apalachicola because I think turtles like, uh, alligator snappers that are limited specifically to the rivers they're in. I think they should be identified more based on their river systems. Mm-hmm. And because the Flint Apalachicola system is completely different than the next systems to either side, mm-hmm. I still call them Apalachicolas. You know, I figured. So do you, you know, do you feel that they, you know, they are a valid subspecies? I mean, without, oh, yeah. without being able to do the genetic work yourself, or do you think it's a distinct locale, a local variation? Um, well, the, the head, if I were, okay, if I were to go down the list, mm-hmm. <laughs> the head is different. The head is, if you were to take from the nostril to the back of the skull, mm-hmm. um, the skull is wider, sometimes almost wider than it is long. To me, okay. I have the long head. Swanaiensis has a long head. Apalachicola has a bulldog head. So the uh-huh. eye, the distance from the eye to the tip of the snout is much shorter. Okay. And then, yeah. and then right behind the eye, the head just expands. It even you can see this even in hatchlings and juveniles. Like a, the head like a pit bull head. Yeah. And then they have like greatly reduced supermarginals. Those extra scutes on the side of the shell. Yep. I actually documented one with no supermarginals. Really? So, yeah, they're so reduced in the, especially the Flint River system. I mean, they basically look like somebody just stuck them on there. They're like so small, 
but then if you look at like a Sewanee or a Tamiki, yeah, they have these big chunky super marginals on the side of the shell. So for whatever reason, as they worked their way up that river system and got further and further north in the Flint, they became mollusk specialists in developing these giant heads. And they mm -hmm. uh, apparently for whatever purpose the super marginals serve, they seem to not really need them as much anymore um, because they're, they seem to definitely just be almost an afterthought when you look at them. What, um, um, how much actual active foraging uh, or hunting do alligator snappers do? Or, or I mean, or I mean, is it is it you know ninety percent luring and ten percent hunting, or or is it? Well, so without having a big whiteboard behind me to draw it all on and, and, and teach, a <laughs> you should have done that. What's wrong with you? Um, so in the beginning, when they're hatchling all the way up till they're about five or six inches, most of it is active luring during the daytime in shallow warm water, and then around sunset they forage, and then at night they have they hide because okay. they can be eaten by a predator or a larger alligator sure. snapper. And then in that meantime, between about six inches to about 12 inches, they do, let's call it 50-50 luring and foraging. Then as they hit about 12 inches plus, they start foraging in the early part of the evening and uh, early morning. And then it seems the adults are strict foragers. I mean, they're not, by the time they're, by the time they're 90 to 100 pounds or even, an, even a female that's 50 pounds, that's a big turtle. Yeah. And they're not fooling anything with that lure. You know, they're not yeah. they're not gonna feed on mosquito fish or anything wow. like that. And game fish are too fast to to really to really get lured in there and go for that. Uh, the luring seems to be an innate behavior that's like a reflex. So mm -hmm. I, I can tell you from my captives, when they get hungry or when they see me, they'll just start luring. Okay. Right. So it's like a reflex. So if they see me, they know I'm the guy with the food. So then they start luring. They like can't help it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it seems that the lure is to get them through that delicate stage because they grow so slowly to get them through, like get them an easy meal during the day, the, the quicker they can grow, um, topping off fish. But the foraging behavior definitely seems to increase with age. And then the adults are, you know, foragers and um, spend most of early spring and fall doing most of their foraging midsummer. Midsummer is about the only time where it seems like the numbers out late at night seem to drop to just lone individuals because okay. they just don't need to eat that much. Their metabolism so slow. You you mentioned that um, they they grow slow. So how would you compare that to a common or Florida snapper? See, now I I don't I, you know I have limited um, captive captive experience with alligator snappers. I've had a few throughout my life. Usually mm -hmm. mostly young animals that were only temporary, uh, yeah. but you know. I mean, we have a common snapper or two that comes and nests in our, she'll probably be showing up any day now that comes to nest into yeah. our yard. Um, so we've done our fair share of uh, just from being a kid of raising common snappers. And they are, even when you seem to pull back on feeding them, they seem to just yeah. take off. It's almost like the RL dabber tortoises, Kevin, I'm sure you're, you're starting to experience it too. You know, no matter how much you try to pull back, they, it's like you come out the next morning and you're like, what the, you know? Yeah. Yeah, common snappers grow so much faster, and it, it's interesting to me because I've always fed most of my turtles natural foods. I'm not too heavy on pellets, okay. Um, but I've noticed that now that common snappers really seem to be gaining traction as like a as a pet turtle, um, I'm seeing people get common snappers up to adult size in like five years, which is uh, not necessarily a good thing. But... Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. But I mean, they they're capable of astounding growth. But the other thing they're also capable of is males are capable of breeding at like six or seven inches mm -hmm. and and common snappers i mean the, the females have to be bigger but you know males are you know you can tell it's a male you know pretty right away whereas an alligator snapper you can't really accurately sex it till they're yeah. you know, 13 14 inches you know um so there's a big difference between how they grow and how they mature and um there's really more differences than there are similarities between the two i I consider yeah. alligator snappers have more similarities to musk turtles than I do uh, common snappers. No kidding. Uh, yeah, the, the way their jaw is shaped, the way their skull is. If you were to look at a skull of a musk turtle and a skull of an alligator snapper, alligator snapper's skull is roofed in the same way. It's a solid piece like a musk turtle. Lower jaw is shaped the same. The way they grow plates in their jaws is the same shape and the way that you know, musk turtles grow plates. Common snappers can't grow those plates in their jaws. Okay. Wow. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, we're we're going down the rabbit hole. So no, so, you're you're I, I gotta, of, you are a wealth of knowledge with this, my that's friend. That's where we wanted to go. Yeah. This, yeah, that's incredible because these are the kind of things you know uh, that, and again, you know, this is an underrated group of turtles that 
you know, like you said, not, you know, I mean, there are plenty of people that do love snapping turtles, but there are a lot of people that overlook them because they don't have a star pattern on their shell or, or something mm-hmm. that's going to make, you know, that they can't show off to somebody, you know? So it's really, um, I mean, you're, you're telling me things that I had no idea about, you know, and I love snapping turtles, you know, so I think it's great. Keep going. Kevin, were you going to, uh, yeah. Add- so what I just want to say, I'm, I plan to watch this, our own episode again to like, like learn this all and right? get so much information. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So learn something, yeah. Um, so I got a couple more questions for you. One is, what is the natural diet of alligator snappers, and how would you supplement that in captivity? So uh, if you were to look at reports of alligator snapper diet, let's let's look in a broad sense. We'll just call them macrochelys as a whole, because each river system they're going to feed on what's in that river. So. Uh, if you were to go over to like where Viv and Carl are doing Texas turtles and trapping alligator snapping turtles, you'll see similar stuff to here, but maybe not as heavy on the mollusks, right? Um, mm-hmm. One common diet item across the entire range, I read it in Pritchard's book and I've seen it in a couple other studies, is crayfish seem to be one of their favorite things. And musk turtles seem to be their th- favorite things. Um, this is with adults. Um, and then they eat a lot of uh, vegetation in the fall. Um, they're opportunists for things like acorns and nuts and fruit. Um, wow. they'll, they will scavenge, but they don't seem to like rotten meat that much. And I, I, from what I've heard from trappers, if you, if they use like rotten fish, they really don't get them. They'll get like common snappers or soft shells, um, for alligator snappers. When they trap them, they need to use fresh cut fish. Um, a, a lot of times the little ones, they like, are you guys familiar with Helgramites? You guys know what those are? I don't know. So they're this hideous little creature. They're they're a larva of a thing called a Dobson fly. Oh they, yeah, they're yeah. A little worm. They got the like. They look like trimmers. Yep. Yeah. So juveniles love those. Yeah. Steve just Steve just said they live uh, almost two years as a larva. Yeah, yeah that, that's correct. Yeah. So, so I, on many occasions, I've seen juveniles, you know, actively flipping over lock, rocks on the bottom of creeks, trying to get to to helgramites, uh, crayfish. Again, is a big one. Um, they'll actually eat a lot of snails. I know in the, um, and some of the creeks I'm at in the Flint and then as well as down the Florida Springs, there's places where there's tiny little black snails all over the vegetation and they'll eat those. Uh, you, you know, sometimes you'll pick one up and it'll poop and you'll just get all these little fragments of snails and crayfish on you. Uh, so I, captive diet, I do, um, I sent Steve some images of, um, yeah. some stuff from a Asian market. That's where I go for most of my stuff. Um, and so I, uh, I used, uh, a lot of apple snails for my adults cause they like to eat apple snails and big snails. I'll use, uh, mussels, clams. Uh, I buy big bags of crayfish. I uh, I'll use, uh, cray or catfish heads. That's a big favorite. Cause there's like the calcium of the skull in there and there's a lot of meat on it and they just love the scent. Mm. And so I have like a pond for my adults and what I'll do to encourage that foraging behavior is I'll go hide like Easter eggs, the catfish heads in the pond. That's and then great. I do that in the early evening and then I come out at night and they'll run around trying to find them. That's fantastic. Um, I've done a couple videos where I feed them at night and they'll take food off of tongs, but um, I really don't want to change what they are and turn them into like a pet because they're not, you know, they're, my adults are wild and, you know, I got them through, you know, my state permit and stuff. So if, if I were to ever to move, you know, and somebody really botches it and they end up back in the wild, I don't want them to, you know, I don't, I don't think they'll ever forget how to be wild turtles, but I don't want them to think that people are a good thing. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand that. There's certain species that you can't get around that with no matter what, you know, they're just forget it. You know, you, you set them up as natural as you possibly can and you go anywhere near them and they know, they know you're there and they're running to you like they love you or something, yeah. which is not the case. But, you know, did you did you mention before um, th- that a part of the diet is they're, they're eating musk turtles? They're actively seeking out musk turtles. That's one of their favorites. Yeah. So that's incredible. Wow. It throughout that. That's one of the things that throughout their range. Um, when they do diet studies, no matter what area they're in, people find pieces of musk turtles in them. Um, and that's, that's one of the ways I know a place to look for, uh, alligator snapping turtles is if I see a bunch of loggerhead musk turtles everywhere. And then if I see a bunch of like broken clamshells on the bottom, there's an alligator snapping turtle there somewhere. Wow. Hmm. And what size, uh, do you know what size they start going after, uh, musks or is it like, will a juvenile go after juvenile musks or hatchling musks? I mean, I, I know that I know from experience. I had a um, 
I had about a 12 inch one one time get out of a tub and into another tub and it ate a whole bunch of musk turtles and map turtles. So that was about a 12 inch alligator <laughs> snapper. So wow. I, I think it, I think it probably starts, you know, as soon as they think they can fit another turtle in their mouth, you know? Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they, 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 they seem to really like to eat hard things and I've watched them, you know, I've watched the adults in the pond and I've watched them in the wild kind of pick stuff up and roll it around in their mouth. It seems to be really tactile. Mm-hmm. And I've seen them just kind of pick things up and feel it and then put it back down. Um, Terrapins do that. I think, I think map turtles do too. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's a wearing down the plates thing because yeah. um, I've, I've seen adults here with where the plates on the head are so huge. The eyes are, you know, all yeah. shrunken in the head and they can barely right. close their mouth and stuff. So uh, they'll also eat for whatever reason. I, I've talked to Viv about this before, but I've seen where they, they'll just eat wood in the, in the fall. Wow. They'll, they'll just go eat bark off of logs and pieces of wood. And um, I've been out herping with my buddy Noah and we've been shining a creek and we found just a big turd of wood one time. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's sort of like a beaver or something. But that's that's the other way I find them, too, is I just look for their scat on the bottom of the creek. Does like, anyone here know why you would buy catfish heads by the pound? Why or is- where? So what, what is it that's being that's for soup? It's good flavor for soup. Style. Yeah. Oh, hey, let me tell you something, man. My my great grandmother, my Nana, she would uh, we're Italian. So seafood is, is a big deal for us. And she we would have these crazy seafood dinners when, when my grandparents lived up north and they would get lobsters. My Nana would would give us the tail and the claws. All she wanted was the head. OK, yeah. mm. so there you go. Maybe somebody maybe somebody's Nana is eating. Yeah. catfish heads and you know what that woman's gonna live to be 92 years old too hey uh, we have a few more questions well, <laughs> go for it Kev. let's do it buddy well i want to piggyback actually on the last one uh catfish heads? are there are there no no on the uh yeah. snapping turtles diet oh. uh are there <laughs> sorry but you're not i'm sorry caring about your non on catfish you know <laughs> lobster what's the matter i was you? the one that asked Sorry. a stupid question it's okay <laughs> oh man all right so are there any uh anything in its diet any animals in its diet that could potentially h- cause harm back to the animal um, like for yeah. instance okay good sorry oh sorry no i want to know what your for instance was <laughs> no like uh yeah, for, velociraptor. so no like for me personally like i keep terrapins as you know and when i first started introducing fiddler crabs into them they the captive bred animals never saw through the crabs, so they didn't know to watch out for the claw. So now they're swimming around with a claw on their head, like literally just like a claw hanging up, but holding on to them. And then after like the third, fourth time, you see them actually go after, and they just bite the claw off first and just discard it, and then they know. They learn. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So is there yeah, any I think, food sources? I think alligator snappers kind of welcome the battle a little bit. Um, I've watched I've watched alligator snappers that are you know almost the same size as a crayfish, just kind of methodically pick at it to de-arm it and then, you know, make a meal out of it. And I've seen musk turtles do the same thing, but um, the I would say the only animals that they eat that could harm them would be when they're juveniles and they eat things like small catfish. The barbs can get okay. stuck in their throat. Oh, wow. Uh, I found uh, one okay. last year and it had a massive infection in the neck. And what had happened was that it had eaten the catfish, the spine got in the neck, caused a wound, and then he was spending the daytime in really hot, shallow water that was full of bacteria and so that wound got bacteria in it from where he was sitting and it swole up and he looked like he had like a turtleneck on and um i took him to uh uga i took him to uga to to get him fixed up but he had an infection and uh how long do you think he was like that probably a probably better part of a week um i think i want to say it was like a few weeks beforehand my buddy kevin brazzy um, had come up from Florida and actually spotted the same turtle in the same area um, with me. And then I went back like a week or two later, and that's when I found him sitting in the shallows. And I was like, hey, man, I found that turtle we saw, you know. <laughs> wow. That's am- it's amazing, though, that like e- even that, you know, amount of time that the animal was 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 still alive. And did you know if it made it? Um, they, they're they not supposed to tell me, but through a veterinarian friend of mine, I heard it didn't make it. I, I Did not make it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like most veterinarians don't really know how to handle snapping turtles, especially alligator snapping turtles. Like Mm -hmm. I know that I've taken them to vets before and they're just like, well, he didn't eat right away. And it's like, yeah, you don't know these things that 
they can hold a grudge and not eat for a year and be fine. So it's, we had a we don't go on that. <laughs> we had a situation today, which goes back to Anthony's question before. He was asking if the terrapins had started, and we thought they may had start may have started today because we got a call off site from a, from not one of our three sites, a, a different area. Uh, where a couple had found a, a terrapin that was injured on the road. So my, my wife jumped in the truck and she headed down to the site and, you know, we're thinking like, man, they, they started up there, but that, that's like 40 minutes north of here. We're, we're warmer down here. So she gets there and it turns out that it's um, a, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, it was a male. It was a male that was actually on the road and the only reason the strike propeller had clipped the back end of them and piggybacking off what you said about vets, she had to go, she spent the better part of today trying to get some of these so-called rehabbers and vets to, um, to taking, uh, the turtle. And then finally someone was able to take it because nobody was familiar with, you know, and these are people that have seen turtles and stuff, but they didn't know how to assess that situation, you know, yeah. or that species for that matter. Yeah, they're definitely, they're not all the same. Yeah. Going to get weird here for a minute. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> He's getting weird. Uh, so let me get back into the questions. Uh, what are the most valuable things you've learned from observing turtles in the wild that have changed the way you keep turtles in captivity? Um, I learned early on from observing turtles in the wild uh, not to be afraid of winter and that winter is your friend. Um, and watch it because, you know, I'll go out in the winter and if you get a nice day, you'll see, you, you'll see turtles and you'll see, you know, maybe not a lot of activity, but you will um, you, you will get activity, you know what I mean? And, um, I, once I started seeing that, I started to stop bringing things. I, I just, I had the Florida mentality that I grew up with that winter was this, you know, game of Thrones thing that winter was coming and I needed to be afraid of it. And, um, I started to realize that, that turtles and all reptiles, all animals, they need the winter. And my yeah. turtle started to thrive more uh, going through the winter and sitting down at the bottom of the pond and not being afraid if the ice is over. And, um, I started, you know, noticing over the years that my turtles were growing through the winter. You know, I, they would, they would go in in November. And by the time I looked at them in, you know, March or April, you know, they had grown. And so seeing, seeing turtles doing just fine in the winter that I, you know, for whatever reason had it in my head was this bad thing. And then I'd see them in the wild and doing just fine. And, that was when I was like, oh, okay, well, there's a way, there's a way to do it at home. It was just a matter of, of figuring it out and, and being obviously safe about it because you are dealing with live animals. But um, I just, yeah, I just started seeing things in the, in the wild and the way things work. And I don't ever have turtles get sick. I hardly ever have anything die. Um, and then, I'm no, you know, turtles know how to take care of themselves. If they start to feel lousy they'll go put themselves in the sun you know during you know most of the day and kind of fight it that way and um yeah i just found that uh maybe in the beginning i was trying to do too much you know like it was a case of trying too hard and then if i if i leave it up to them you know they've been around for millions of years they've they've got it down yeah i'm glad you brought up the winter thing because that's something anthony and i have talked about uh several times you know especially being up here in the Northeast, you know, and, and just how important winter is, you know, and, and, um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure you feel the same, Anthony. Oh, absolutely. Do we just become best friends? <laughs> yup. <laughs> That's from Step Brothers. Step Brothers. Well, we know. <clears throat> well, come on, help me out. I got a, well, I, 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 thought, I thought, I thought Greg was going to answer it. I'm sorry. No, yeah, I was just going to, I concur. <laughs> you and your buddy Kevin, you guys, you guys don't look so like you look similar. From what I pictures like I saw earlier on, I got oh, you guys yeah. confused a bunch of times. You know, who Kevin and, Brazzy? Uh, yeah, you guys could be step brothers. You know, I, yeah, that was the guy. Remember, we were talking about his name. Yeah, yeah. Kevin's case. Yep. Oh, I oh, thought yes? his last name was Brazzi. Remember, yeah, we had a conversation. Brazzi. Kevin Brazzi. I like yeah, that. Kevin's awesome. I did a video um, showing his help, his uh, setups in his uh, apartments. Um, yeah, he's somebody I, I met I, basically through Instagram, and then it turned out, this is funny, so where I grew up for a while in Florida was Vero Beach, where he lives, and we both went to the same summer camp, we both skated, we both knew a dude that I rode on the same skateboard company with at one point, so we had like common friends and all that stuff, so my last trip, or one of my last trips down to Florida, um, 
I, I stayed at Kevin's house and we filmed the whole episode of his tub setups and he has these really nice tub setups. And I, I mean, one of the best things about meeting turtle people is seeing how other people do things and getting to exchange ideas and borrow things from each other. And mm -hmm. I really liked what he does and I've implemented some of that, you know, here at my house. That's awesome. awesome. Very cool. Really cool. My parents sold the house in Vero Beach today. Oh. <laughs> it's weird, but you know. I miss it. Uh, yeah, I want to go. I want to go check it out. You and uh, you and Kevin should come up north, see the animals here. We go skateboarding. You bring you to like your worst parks in Connecticut because they're like ninety percent <laughs> bad. <laughs> uh, last question is not from any of the fun. chats, but I got a direct. Yeah, it's, it'll be fun. Uh, but I got a direct text message about it. What are your thoughts on? And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. What are your thoughts on hybrids between alligator snappers and common snapping turtles? And then I'm going to add an addendum to that. Uh, do you know if that happens naturally in like integrate zones? Um, I don't, to, to answer the second part first, I don't know if it happens in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, I know I have a friend and it has happened naturally at his place because he has um, an adult male alligator snapper and several large uh, female Florida snappers in a saltwater crock pond. Um, and it happens year after year at his place. Um, so I, I don't, from what I've observed in the wild, they don't get along. Um, I've seen alligator snappers literally push a common snapper out of the water and the commons will sit on the bank for hours stressed out, like they won't even function. Um, and then I've also seen common snappers in creeks that have alligator snappers and I've found the common snapper the next week, you know, halfway consumed. So I think it'd be extremely rare for it to happen in the wild. I mean, I, I don't want to, a sith, only a sith deals in absolutes. So I'm not going to say it never happens, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I've, I've got one and um, he's a interesting little creature. And I was telling another guy today or yesterday that um, because of that turtle, I have more people nagging me and asking me for it and wanting to buy mm -hmm. it and trade it. And, and to be honest, I'm not really into hybrids. Um, I have that hybrid. And then I also have a Eastern River Cooter Northern Map Integrate. Um, I've been holding on to it for whip givens or somebody to come take a tissue sample and verify it. But, um, I I've seen that in, there's like a new generation of captive keeper that's really into the morphs and really into making hybrids and, and all of these things. And I, maybe it's the old school in me, but I feel like that energy is better put towards conservation and, and making assurance colonies. But I mean, I, I also think that people liking turtles and wanting to breed turtles is good either way, but, um, it's just not for me. Greg, you, you know, the things you're saying, man, I, I, I feel like we should get a one bedroom, bedroom apartment with a loft or something, man. I, I, <laughs> I, I literally, I feel like I'm talking to myself, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I, it's, I feel the same way, man. I think any, any positive energy <laughs> towards turtles and co whether it's conservation or preservation is, uh, it's priceless. You know what I mean? But, um, you know, it, it's, it's true. You know, I, I'm a purist. I absolutely am. But I, I have, uh, two hybrids here that, um, are really interesting animals. And one of them just happens to be made up of like two of my favorite species. So, you know, um, but to go back to Kevin's question, um, I, I feel, and I think that this has been answered by other people too, that sometimes these intergrades or hybridizations or bastards as they call them occur because, uh, there's either not enough or any of the other type of turtle. So my example is I have a hybrid here, Blanding's wood turtle, North American wood turtle, 50, 50 dad was a Blanding's mom is a wood. And the only reason that that happened was because the individual that, that had the mother wood turtle, there was no male wood turtle and there was no other Blanding's turtles in there. And a male was placed into that same, uh, enclosure. And there you go. Uh, for for several consecutive years i don't know exactly how long but this is going back to 96 when it first started all the eggs that this female word turtle produced were 50 50 blandings wood and i have one of those now he's an adult male um but i have always kept my blandings and wood turtles together here since i was a kid and there has never been any hybridization because they have members of their own kind at least that, that's what i feel is happening or why it's not happening um but uh with, with the hybrid that, that you're talking about, that's common snapper, alligator snapper, do you notice any preferences with the animal? Because the reason I'm asking is, with this particular hybrid that I'm talking about, even though he's 
he absolutely will not even acknowledge the existence of Blanding's turtles. He's only interested in fighting, breeding, and interacting with wood turtles. So, okay, so I, since, I have, since I have two hybrids, um, I will say, and I've noticed this in both of them, they're almost a little bit schizophrenic in which side they want to favor. So if we're going to talk about the cooter map hybrid, it'll go back and forth on whether it wants to eat algae and plants in its enclosure or whether it's going to obsess over little snails. Um, but like you were talking about, how it wants to interact with one species, it will only bask with the blotched maps. Wow. If, I have a, if I have a cooter in there, it won't bask with the cooter. It'll only line itself up with the, with the blotch maps that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the hybrid snapper, I don't keep with anything else um, just because it's a snapper. And, um, but I've noticed that behavior-wise, it likes to position itself the way an alligator snapper does. Like a lot of times little ones like to be vertical for luring mm -hmm. and being close to the surface. But instead of wanting to do that and do it in like a hidden way it's more like a common snapper where it doesn't really mind being out in the open yeah um, it doesn't lure because it doesn't have a lure but its tongue has like a little i have a photo somewhere on my like Flickr page but um I, i've been trying to get a photo of the tongue because he does have a little nubbin on his tongue huh. um but he never tries to lure with it but the guy i got him from said that no two are the same some will try to lure some won't. Some have long necks. Some have short necks. And if you That's if you were to hold three of them together, all three would look physically a little different. Okay. So uh, there's yeah, there's some weird stuff that goes on with with all that hybridization stuff. It's and, really really weird. It, it, yeah. It's it's very interesting. I will say, but again, you know, I, I don't promote it. You know, as in, you know, trying to do it, per, trying yeah. to make it happen. You know, this was an accident. This animal came to me, and and it's really something to see how genetically he's. 50%, but you know, like, you know, I won't yeah. go too far into it, but you know what I'm getting at. <clears throat> so, yeah. And, All right, guys. And, oh. Oh. No, please huh? go on, go on. I didn't no, really cut you off. The only thing I was going to say is like, you know, I, I, I'm sure like most of you guys, I wasn't always like, you know, Johnny conservation. Um, you know, when I was younger, <laughs> I, I had the idea that I wanted to be like a turtle farmer or like a turtle breeder, especially when I first started getting into like seeing um, kingsnake.com and buying turtles online and, um, I, I, I just had this idea of like, dude, I can make all these ponds and I could keep things the way I keep them. And I would probably produce more babies cause I'd be doing it naturally. And, you know, I, I started wanting to kind of collect different things and, and, and get all that. And then over time I started to see a, a change in the way people were buying things and who was buying things. And it started to become Asia buying most of our stuff. And it got to the point where people were coming to my state to my spots where I look for turtles and I was finding, you know, little campsites and, and traps and stuff everywhere. And it, I just, it started to get like really ugly to the, where I, I mean, I, I'm not against selling turtles, but I am against me personally doing it because I feel like turtles are in a bad situation right now. And that's one reason why. Um, so I, you know, people always ask me, do you sell turtles? And I just tell them, no, no, I didn't, you know, I, I just, I, I don't want to throw my hat into that anymore. And um, I would rather, I would rather do things that educate people maybe on, on the actual, what they're getting into and um, what, what actual care is, what are actual good species to keep. And then um, right. just kind of, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say combating the exports to China, but I, at, at some point I think we're going to have to. Well, I think it, I think that's something that at this point, like you said, with the situation that turtles are in as a whole is something that ha it has to be combated. It absolutely has to. You know, I, I get contacted, you know, probably to, if I go look at my email right now, there's probably something right now. You know, will you export your wood turtles to Hong Kong or something like that? You know, it's never ending, it, it, you know, and I never have and I never will, you know, Um Obviously, I'm not against selling turtles. You know that that goes without saying, but um, I can I can definitely see with why somebody would choose not to do it. You know, yeah. um, and and you know part of the truth is, you could try to vet people as much as you want. You can say I don't export, which I don't. You know, um, but I don't truly know where all my animals are going to end up. You know, especially if somebody's buying multiple ones. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's it's um six and one half a dozen of another and it, it's a double-edged sword right now unfortunately but you know um i think you know education without a doubt 
for both the conservation side of it and the, cap the responsible captive keeping side of it is important, you know, because the animals are never not going to be in captivity. So why not educate people to do it right? You know, and I think what, what you promote on your page and everything that you're doing is, is I love it. You know, I think it's well, you're one of the few pages that I actually like to follow. So, oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, that's I, think, uh, I had a I had a pair of turtles. This is like the last I'll say about it. And this is like the where I drew the line in the sand is several times this had happened. And then the last time it happened was I sold a pair of musk turtles to a guy and he told me they were for him and his son. Gave me this whole spiel. Oh, so I yeah. sold these turtles and he emailed me, hey, they arrived. They're beautiful. We love them. Um, my son is so happy. And then two days later, they were up on fauna for twice what he paid for them. Oh yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, I, I don't want to admit to how many times I've had that happen. Yeah, I think I'm done. His son changed his mind. It's not his fault. Yeah. <laughs> Happened to me before too. Yeah, oh, it really yeah. stings. It really yeah. stings. Yeah. It does. That's... Yeah. But what are you going to do? I, you know, I've had this conversation with Ralph a million times. It sticks out in my head because we've had that conversation so many times. But it doesn't matter if you sell it for a good price or not. Once you sell it. That's it. You want to give it to somebody and say, I'm, you know, doing this because I appreciate our relationship and don't sell it. If you ever don't want it, you give it back to me. That's one thing, but you give somebody a good deal. You just gave somebody a good deal. Yeah. So, um, Kevin, would you like to introduce the new feature that you just came up with for this show? Um, solely yeah. for the show. That would be great. Now, as of right now, it's solely for this show, but who knows? Maybe this will work out in the future. We might like it. That's a good point. You know? Let's see. All Let's right. So, for a spin. on the fly, I named this Picture This. Okay. Oh, my gosh. That's so, so good. What, yeah, that's I cute. thought so. Aw. Yeah. Really, really oh, cute. The, that, not me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so, Greg sent uh, probably about like three to 4,000 photos for tonight, right? Something like that. Like some ridiculous amount of photos. We asked him to. We asked him to. Yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. he's thorough, and that's how it should be. Yeah, it's, it's great. So what, what's going to happen is that Steve is going to pop up. These are the rules. Steve is going to pop up images on the screen, okay? One second clips or one second at a time. Now, the four of us, we each pick one picture. So you would say stop. So, Chris, if you want to say stop, you say stop on this picture. Greg has 30 seconds to tell us about that photo and why he chose it. So, so We all go around. Okay. Does that make sense? I love yeah, that. Yeah, okay. we'll do 30 seconds, you know. So we're just gonna we're just all gonna start yelling basically. Yeah, we'll say stop when you see the picture you want. But what okay, if we all say stop at the same time? Then that's the best picture. You just does okay, one time. So oh, okay. Thirty seconds to talk about a photo I sent you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're good. You tell us about it. Something okay. interesting or crazy, anything. Okay. All right. You want me to count it off? I got a timer going. I'll have a yeah, timer. Oh, Kevin's got a timer. Wow, Kevin's really good tonight. All right, Kev, go. He is. He's on. He's on top of it. Okay. Stop. Uh, go back. Okay. Go back. Okay. Yeah. All right, go. Yep, go. go. So, yeah, female striped neck musk turtle from eastern Alabama. Uh, I took that, I think, last October, November for one of my Field Hurt Friday videos. I caught, like, three or four that day. That was the last one. Um, and I like was like, oh, I need like a, a good thumbnail, and I haven't shot a photo of a striped neck musk turtle in a long time. So I shot that one, and then also a wide angle of that showing the creek. Um, and those are probably my favorite musk turtle. They're just they're beautiful, and um, another enigmatic kind of turtle. Like um, they're kind of particular to where they like to live. A lot of people associate turtles with needing to be warm all the time, and they like to live in cool, flowing trout streams. And um, awesome, awesome turtles. All right. So that was Chris. Chris, you're out. I'm you're out. out oh, I'm out. What? Yeah. Oh. No. I did. No. Go back to. Oh, he did. Okay. I'm out. Right I can't there. Speak. This one? Yeah. Okay. That's my Mexican giant musk turtle. Stereotype is Tripercatus. Uh, bought this from a guy locally um a few years ago uh one of my favorite turtles uh just starotypus and the mexican musk turtles are just some of my favorites of the whole um that guy eats exclusively mollusks uh he only eats corbicula clams white clams apple snails uh small snails and crayfish so one of my favorite turtles i love the diet specs that's great this is fun this is fun. yeah i like this one so, so Kevin's out. It's just Anthony now. It's just me. I'm yeah. just gonna. I'm gonna make everybody wait, and it's just 
you know, Hopefully, you don't run out of photos. This one, maybe I will. Oh, Chris, oh, back up there. Stop. No, that one. I want that one. I want the map. I want okay, the map. that one. Uh, so that's a baby northern map turtle, Geographica. Uh, found so the the hybrid map turtle was found exactly next to this one. So it was like a fresh hatch nest. And I guess the the hybrid cooter map was part of the same clutch with the rest of these Geographica. Uh, they were all found within two feet of each other. Um, so I shot a bunch of photos, and I needed a photo to compare this Geographica with the hybrid. So I shot them in the same place. And then the neat thing with these Geographica is they have black eyes. Awesome. Yeah, those are, that is really cool. I'm glad that you stopped on that photo, Anthony. That's yeah. great. I know what I'm now doing. Now I do want Greg to pick a photo, too. It's not my first rodeo. Right, You're out now. That. Now it's just Greg. Oh, we still have the same group of photos, though. So you've seen them all once. Uh, right there. Quebec, the giant turtle, Thailand. Oh. Um, so, yeah, this is from my recent trip to Thailand. Uh, this is from the town that I spent most of my time in. It's like kind of home base where I would travel throughout northern Thailand. Um, turtles are very sacred to the Buddhists in northern Thailand. And so uh, when I went there like last February through March, it was the dry season. And I, my biggest thing on my itinerary was to see turtles. And the best places to see them, unfortunately, right now is in the temples where people have brought turtles that are rescued. Somebody wanted to eat them or they found it in the road. So most of the elongated tortoises, snail-eating turtles, uh, and ambienensis were there. And then I also went to a mountain that was uh, the last holdout for uh, Asian big-headed turtles. And there's a little old lady that runs a big pen. She has like a concrete pen with a fake stream and has a bunch of uh, Asian big-head turtles in there. They're the last of the mountain. And I think I'm the only wow. foreigner that's been able to see that because my father-in-law is uh, police. So he, lets, he gets me into like all kinds of stuff. That's awesome. So cool. That's wow. so cool. Okay, so, yeah, Kevin, I think like your little plan worked out. Yeah, yeah, I like this one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. Now we're moving on to our next segment, um, which we call, which we yeah. call pit and peak. Yeah. Pit and peak. So um, we're going to um, talk about something that's going really well for us and something that has us really bummed out because I think. A lot of times with social media, we all too often share, you know, uh, all the positive stuff that's going on and don't share enough of the negative. Although there are exceptions to that rule. People who talk about their, you know, cramps or <laughs> how much they hate their job or whatever. Ugh, when, it's cramps. I can't do yeah, that. I'm really sorry about the cramps post. <laughs> that was totally you. That was totally <laughs> you. All right. So who wants to go first? I'll go first. I was the least okay. prepared, so I'll jump into it. Oh, that makes sense. He's got that confidence was... and great ideas tonight. You're going to be able insane, to fit man. your giant head through that doorway? <laughs> Can no, I just you... tell you something? This is, this is what I knew Kevin had in him, and this is why I constantly pester him. I know it sounds bad, but like that big brother thing where you're like, yeah, like, Come on, man. I know you can do it. Like, God, he's, he's crushing it right now. I, yeah, I didn't really talk nice for like guys. 40 minutes on this show. I didn't know. Need I couldn't to. believe it. You were so quiet. Yeah. I didn't need to. I'll it sit here nice. and just. I'll coast every show. I will he's, coast he, every His beard looks show. great, so he, he's good. Uh, he can be quiet and look good. <laughs> Thank you. No my, cutting my, needs to get bigger and bigger, right? I, this is my COVID beard. That's I'm your just, COVID yeah. playoff <laughs> beard. Yeah. Until we get out of this pandemic, I'm going. Yeah. To... Dude, just go. Will you go one year without cutting it at all? Maybe I didn't even. I haven't cut my hair. I look. I'm getting closer and closer to Santa Claus over here. I got, getting... I got two haircuts during this uh, pandemic. One was from my wife, and then I finally got a real one. And, you know, oh. I don't know. I think, I, but I'm liking that beard, man. You know? Thank you. Thank you. My hair on, on the top the of my head the, grows shorter. By the time slower. the pandemic's over, you're going to be that old guy sitting on the porch yelling at cars that are parked saying, Hey, slow down. <laughs> this is a neighborhood. Oh, I'm close, I'm close to that already. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. So. Go ahead, Kevin. Cabs yeah, up. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go I'm gonna go in reverse. I'm gonna say what my peak is first. That's fine. Yeah. So my peak, because the, the pit ties into it actually. Uh my peak is that I'm 99% done setting up my outdoor enclosures for the year in plenty of time. So I feel really confident about that. I don't have to rush anything anymore. It's I'm good, I'm out of the way. And I was able to do that be, unfortunately because of COVID, you know, we're home. I was home for six weeks and it just gave me an abundant amount of time to do everything. So that I'm very happy about. Uh, my pit, though, is that I have a predator in my yard. I don't know what it is. 
Uh, so I've ordered trail cameras to find out. Uh, and the reason I put it in air quotes is because no animals are being injured at all. They're not like, I don't know how. Um, but I have all this grass that's ripped up in my pens, like to the point the turtles didn't do this. This is like a larger animal. I had, uh, I had one enclosure that had like chicken wire on top. And this is what makes me think it's these, uh, great big herons that are coming. I live coastal about a quarter mile from the ocean or the sound. And the chicken wire is just smashed in, like it just broken. So I don't know what it is. I should find out within the next week. I'm going to set everything back up with the cameras and uh, go from there. So I'll let you know in the next podcast. That's awesome, man. That, that, that didn't sound too bad. It didn't sound like you were too uh, unprepared. You should have just went with it and we would have been impressed. Well, I like to be honest, you know? I know. I know. It's, it's a downfall for you. We're going to have to work on it. Just when I was getting excited about your performance. Uh, you go and get honest on us. Okay, I just saw a transition. That means it's my turn. I'm going to go next, Chris, because I don't want to follow you anymore. Last couple of shows, I think I had to follow you on this, and it's, it, it wasn't pretty for me. Somebody probably so, should follow me on my pit. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, yeah, you do have a big pit this week, mm-hmm. this month. Um, okay, so uh, my pit and peak is really the same thing. It's it's one... It's, it's one um, situation that is both a pit and a peak. So um, those are uh, Gio Yamada Japonica, Ryuku, Ryu, Ryuku black-breasted leaf turtles um, from uh, islands, the Japanese islands. Um, they are tough to breed. At least they've been tough to breed for me. I have this pair that I've been trying to, this particular pair that I've been trying to breed for quite a few years now the male i've been raising since 2013 he's just not interested in the ladies at all um this year he decided to finally mount the female which is awesome first time was on april 3rd and she's been gravid for the last like three weeks with some pretty well developed eggs but she's not even like she hasn't even gotten like restless yet at all so i just freak myself out because i get so nervous because i've had turtles like hold eggs too long, stuff like that. And another species as well that I um, give a picture to Steve on, I don't know if you have it, Steve, is the um, the Japanese uh, subspecies of Flavo, um, Chinese box turtle, which is from the same islands. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Cora, Flavo marginata, Evelene. Um, Evelene? Evelene? Evelene. It's Evelene. Evelene. It's named after a woman named Evelyn. Okay. Um, so I'm going to name the female Evelyn. Right? I just love her so much. I'm naming these turtles after her. Uh, kind of like the Hey There Delilah song. Hey there, so, Evelyn. Creepy you thing. Just like the other one I know. Sorry. <laughs> that, that dude named a turtle after me. I'm never going to talk yeah. to him again. Um, yeah, so same thing with them. Uh, we, Chris and I have a joint project with another friend of ours, which includes two females. Both of them are gravid right now and I'm just waiting for eggs. So I'm really excited, but I'm like freaking out about, um, you know, the timing of it all and, and if they're going to actually lay their eggs. So, um, if you freak out about things like that, like I do, welcome to the team because the struggle is real and that's my pit and peak. Thank you very much. I'm going to do my pit, my failure, and I have prepared some sad music for it. So I, um, I'm usually <laughs> very good at uh, keeping my turtles safe. And I recently failed at this miserably. And what made it even worse was that some of the turtles that we lost were not even mine. So what I'm getting at is... I learned two valuable things recently. One, my predator protection does work. And the reason why I had a failure was because this particular method was not working. So one of my brand new electric fences that I put in this year, I did not install properly. And as it turns out, it was not working. But I didn't know because I, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to admit to this stuff, but, you know, like Anthony said, it's not always a pretty picture. Things are not always perfect, and especially not when you're keeping live animals. No matter what the purpose is, there's going to be a lot of negatives, and this was just a really bad one. So because I did not drive the ground rod – by the way, I confirmed that. By the way, by the, um, 
the fact that I did not drive the ground rod for this electric fence far enough into the ground, the fence was not working, even though the controller was telling me that it was on. So um, I don't know how many nights this occurred because there were several turtles missing, but uh, I came out to find that raccoons had, uh, well, I'm assuming they're raccoons because very familiar with what they do, um, happened to take and kill several Chinese box turtles. Um, some of mine, some of Anthony's, and some of uh, another good friend's. Um, and uh, it was really hard to deal with. It was very hard to explain to your best friends that uh, you are responsible for the death of their turtles. Um, but they were both incredible towards me about it and were more concerned with how I was feeling having to deal with something like that. Um, but the positive that comes from this is that... Well, one, I have great friends, and two, that the electric fence absolutely positively does work at keeping predators out because it's when it doesn't work that they get in. Um, and once I found the deceased turtles, I uh, gr immediately grabbed the fence uh, once I was came to and realized what was happening, and sure enough, the fence was not working. And now that the ground rod is driven into the ground properly, uh, it does, in fact, shock terribly. Um so it doesn't look like that'll be happening again, hopefully. But um, lesson to be learned, never, ever, 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 ever turn your back on predation. It is a very serious thing that we all as turtle keepers and zoo keepers and even conservationists have to take into consideration because when it comes to the Terrapin Project, raccoons are almost solely responsible for the decimation of all the uh, eggs, the nests that my wife uh, is working so hard to save. So there you have it. There's my big failure. Uh, this has only ever happened once in my life uh, many years ago with just a couple of turtles. This is the worst one by far that I've gone through. But I learned a hard lesson. Um, you know, make sure all your equipment is working well. And like I said, the positive that comes out of this is that those fences do actually work because it's when they're not working that something goes wrong. So, uh, and by the way, the photo we're using is, is a random photo. That is not, I didn't sit there and film the raccoon attacking the turtles and then tell everybody later. So, um, music was creepy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I had to put something there, you know, it wasn't sad. It was, it was, Hey, look, it said sad music. Okay. I didn't play it myself. <laughs> Next time I'll make it sad for you. Okay. It was like a lifetime movie. Oh yeah. It, yeah. You know what? I, my life is a lifetime movie, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So on to my peak, let's smile again. Uh, I chose this photo because what's happening here is a Herman's tortoise that's using its enclosure enrichment. I've gotten really, really good at providing so many different things in my enclosures that the tortoises and turtles can really exercise. They uh, they can climb, and that's exactly what this animal is doing here. She is climbing into a hibiscus bush to help herself to uh, the lower leaves. And if you look down there, there were there were more leaves, but she got to them, as did some of the other conspecifics. But um, you know similar to what Greg was saying with diet and setting the animals up properly. It's something that I pride myself on and something that I, you know, these animals didn't ask to be in captivity. So since they're in captivity, let's give them anything and everything that they possibly can do to exhibit natural behaviors and uh, just give them that mental enrichment. So that's something that I, I just, I love seeing that. I happened to capture this photo where she just turned her head and looked right at me. Um, and uh, I love seeing it and I highly recommend that do research on plants and other things that you can add to an enclosure to liven it up and make life interesting for the animals. I didn't have any Love good it. music to play during that. I'm sorry. Love it. It was playing in my head. Oh, okay. It was good. It was the Fraggle Rock theme song. <laughs> Worries for another day. Let the yeah. music play. Down okay. a Fraggle Rock. Okay. Uh, okay. They just released uh, the new version that we've been <laughs> watching at home with the kids. Oh, yeah. Did they actually sing it or is it like Justin Timberlake and, and Jimmy Fallon doing it? Which no, no. Like I'm saying a new Fraggle Rock with the same oh, Muppets and everything. No kidding. Wow. Yeah, it's on the Disney Plus. Get on it. Oh, I love Disney Plus. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. Well, Greg is up now. Uh, save the best for last. Our esteemed guest, Greg, take it away. Yeah, I guess um, I think this is the photo I picked for my peak. So I guess... Since you guys are on here all the time, um, you know, you guys go over your pit and peak a lot. I'm going to be more general um, yeah. and just say that I would say my peak is that I'm starting to accept almost being 40 and I'm kind of finding a stride in accepting 
um, that I don't need to have everything. And I'm, you know, saying no and turning animals away. Like, whereas, you know, I think we all did this when we were younger where we just wanted a bunch of turtles. And so I'm kind of satisfied in the things that I keep and I've found a stride in what works for me, where I live and the way I do things. And, um, and also I've gotten really happy with how things work when I go field herping and looking for stuff. I've obviously I've, I've kind of made a niche for myself and that like people know me as the snapping turtle guy, which I'm, I'm happy with. And, you know, I made them my logo for, you know, my, my YouTube channel and my Instagram and kind of adopted that as just part of what I do. And, you know, I've been really happy that this year I got my, uh, you know, state permits to work with protected species and to be able to educate with them. And, um, that was like, a long-term goal that ended up happening a little sooner. Um, and I was glad that it did because, you know, when they came over to my house to do their inspection and stuff, they just, the, the, the guy that came was just like, wow. <laughs> you know, like I, apparently I'm like the, one of the only people in the state doing it the way I do it. And, you know, they asked me if I'd be willing to kind of come to the spring DNR training and train their officers on turtle identification and talk to them about them. That's great. Um, obviously with the pandemic that never happened. Um, and it's been put off for a later date, but I did achieve a goal. And, you know, my goal was, is that whenever I applied for my permits, I just wanted to be, you know, basically undeniable. And I wanted to not only get permitted, but I also wanted to be able to assist in return, um, and, and kind of create something that maybe hasn't been done before. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, for my pit, I would probably say, um, it's more of a personality flaw and that I'm never happy with anything. I'm always like, I, I can walk around my yard and I can tell you every single thing that I hate in my yard. Um, I think I, I gave a photo of um, a Gulf Coast box turtle enclosure where I built it because I went to a guy's house and he showed me that you can use cheap materials to build stuff. And for a while I was all about that. And I made this Gulf Coast box turtle enclosure out of pallets just to say I could do it. And then I built it, and then now it's like my least favorite enclosure in the yard. Um, partly because where I lived before, I had such little space. I wasn't used to building big. Um, so I built this, and in, in my mind, I was like, oh, I built them a big enclosure. But then, you know, I'm standing at the back of, you know, almost an acre <laughs> prairie, basically, in my backyard. And I'm like, oh, this needs to be bigger. Or, you know, this pond needs to be bigger. Or, you know, and I just do that with everything. Um, and you know, I, I watch my videos and I, I'm really hard on myself about what my videos look like or my photos. And, um, so that's my pit is like just the madness of always trying to make stuff and make it better. I really feel like I've been talking to a skinnier, better looking version of myself. <laughs> Jeez. I uh, seriously, <laughs> right. I, I, I literally, I was, I was walking around the yard before my, my wife was like, what's the matter with you? I was like, I hate that pen. She was like, what's wrong with you? I said, I hate that pen. You know, I, yeah. I I, I get it, man. Totally, totally get it. Yeah, and I, I, I like that my sulcas. I, I wanted them to have as close to the best that I could do for sulcas because I feel like sulcas are probably one of the turtles in the pet industry that are getting the biggest shorthand from ninety oh, percent yeah. of the people keeping them. So my, I've, I've always wanted them to have basically a full half acre of just grass to graze on, and they can wander around, but. As time's going by and as I build things, it's, it's getting a little bit more limited. I'm also seeing the limits in what they're actually using versus what I have. And then potentially I have Aquascape coming in October to build a, a big stream into a pond. And so that's going to eat up part of their grazing area. So um, luckily I only have two Sulcos. So yeah. <laughs> I think I'm still in the green. That's great. Anthony, you and I, when we got to see uh, Salcadas at our buddy Andrew's place uh, out in Arizona, um, two, was that two years ago now almost? Um, it, uh, you know, it was really amazing to see that because, you know, up here in the Northeast, everybody is, oh, I have a Salcuda tortoise and uh, its name is Sherry and it lives in my bedroom. And the thing is like, it's it looks like a cone head and, and it's miserable and it eats strawberries with its underbeak. It's like, oh, thanks for a strawberry, bro. But uh, seeing them out there, like in a big pasture setting where they can make these huge burrows and stuff, it was moving. It was like, it gave me like a whole new respect for sulcatas and, and, you know, being able to see them set up in numbers like that. But, you know, anyway. Well, like growing up with gopher tortoises, to me, they're a giant gopher tortoise. Mm -hmm. So I, I had that little bit of feeling that I had when I was a kid when I see them come out of their burrow in the morning and bask at the edge of it and then go and eat some grass. Yeah. So we have less, uh, we have uh, best taxa and then, 
Oh, dang, I was muted. I was I was like trying to go to the next one. Thanks, Chris, for reminding me. Like, oh, why I'm are you sorry. guys not hearing me? Disrespect. <laughs> you are a professional. Turn your mic on. We're going. So timer's up on 30 seconds, Steve. Who's going? It's a minute. Okay. Oh, timer's a minute. A minute. Okay. okay. All right. This is, yeah, that's this right, Steve. Forever. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll go the same order that we just went. Okay, Steve, some people probably got, you know, uh, started to miss Minto. Yeah, they started to miss Minto because he's been Aww. such a such a hero this show. Okay, so let's see who can get the shortest. You don't have to go, go the full minute. If you Anthony, do 30 you want to tell what, we're, what the tax is we're selecting this time? I forgot exactly. The reason why? We do. Yeah, so this is this is going to be the best taxa, best species, subspecies, whatever, that no one has on their radar, but that they should have on their radar um, for reasons such as population decline or conservation status or things like that. Okay? Okay. Go ahead, Minto. All right. So I'm not going to say this animal is not on anyone's radar, but it's a Seben Rockiella crasticolis. It's the black marsh turtle. Or I like to call it the smiling terrapin, as you can see in that photo. That's what a lot of people call it. Uh, it is one of only two turtles in this genus. Uh, the other is Stephen Rockiello latensis. Uh, I think it's Philippine forest turtle. So the reason I chose this animal specifically is they don't produce a lot. They produce only a couple eggs, like one or two eggs a couple times a year. Uh, they are heavily taken for the meat market in Asia. Uh, for Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, also habitat loss, like all the Asian species. Uh, but back in 1999, there were records that showed um, it was like 135,000 of them were taken in 10 months and exported to like Malaysia. Uh, so, or out of Malaysia, excuse me. Um, and it's just, it's an animal that needs protection. I, I tried years ago uh, and I had, I bought some wild call animals from a reptile show. And uh, it's something I definitely want to work with in the future, but only captive bred this time because it just it's a beautiful animal. I love it. And yeah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> that was rough, man. That was about a minute and 12 seconds. One Passionate. Yeah, well, you're better than that. Good job, though. Good job. I didn't see you go with job. that. Thanks. You really shocked me. OK, I'm next, right? Yep. I'm ready. This is a Chelodyna timorensis, Timor snake neck turtle. Um, a, a few of the timers not running. That's right. I'm going to go real slow, so it doesn't matter. I'm, 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 I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I have a couple of these. They're awesome turtles. Really great to keep. Um, they are like nothing else. And I think that a lot of people don't know what the differences are between some of the snake sex, snake neck species. So they don't get the respect that they deserve. And a lot of these species, we talk about map turtles in the U S that are separated by different, you know, river systems and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, different islands have different snake neck turtles and um, there's a lot of different species, even just in the Caledina, um genus. So um, lots of species there to learn about and lots of differences between them. And some of those species, you know, there's just a handful on the island and they're at risk of going extinct super quickly in the wild. So, um, yeah. Wow. That's it. I wasn't done that. You know, he didn't start the timer right away. So that was probably close to a minute. Yeah, so maybe you're a minute and 13 seconds, you know? Who I knows? just mumble maybe. and I move super slow. Yeah. You guys are like auctioneers. I, I probably could have got that done in 20 seconds, but just took my sweet time. <laughs> I like it. it Steve fixed the problem he wants everyone to know we're excited about that <laughs> awesome no more Rest timer issues let's do Me. it I'd be up yep ready Okay, I am actually a little bit disappointed in myself for not picking this taxis, picking this taxis sooner. Uh, this is my be-all, my favorite of all. This is the Western Hermit's tortoise, Testudo hermani hermani, which is actually endangered under the IUCN red list, uh, which is a complete difference compared to its common eastern cousin. And common eastern cousin. Now, the reason I picked this animal is because even though I've been fighting for it my entire life, it is still 
sorely misunderstood, disrespected, and people go after it for the wrong reasons. Bastardization, hybridization is ruining it both in captivity and in the wild, where they are finding uh, even Eastern pure specimens throughout Italy, France, and Spain, which is ruining the animal's genetic purity. Uh, they are sorely overlooked, uh, and what's interesting about them is that they are personable, easy, hardy, amazing to care for, and um, I would highly recommend that people um, pull their eyes out of the bag and start looking at them a little bit closer. They're highly endangered. They're screwed in nature, but I'm doing everything I can in captivity to help them. Boom. Boom. You were you did better than me again. I'm actually disappointed in myself. I think I could have said more nice things about that tortoise, but next time I'd like to see you branch out a little more. They're well, pretty... I haven't I haven't mentioned it once. That was the first time I was, it was my eighth episode or seventh. Can you see my eyes rolling? No, I can't see your eyes rolling behind those dorky glasses. I'm sorry. Maybe take them off so I can see it next time. Call me Where your eyes Have you been on for seven months already? Beard. Seven episodes. So it's seven months. Seven or eight right? episodes. And, and with, you, with each best taxa, I, I just never picked the Western Hermans, which I'm disappointed in myself for, uh, for not picking it. You know, and a couple of people actually messaged me and they were like, come on, why didn't you pick that? And I was like, well, you know, I want to talk about snakes this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People are getting over that real fast, how they were upset with that last show. The snake thing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Shut up and talk about turtles. Yeah, Anthony. I know. Yeah, I got Big death idiot. <laughs> oh, I death okay, Greg's up. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Um, the one I want to talk about uh, for best tax side and one that nobody's really talking about and maybe nobody really knows uh, about this issue going on. It's something I've observed and talked with a couple of other people about, and that is in states like mine in Georgia, the eastern chicken turtle is rapidly losing habitat. Uh, they like these longleaf pine forests, they like sand hills, and they like these, um, you know, sometimes temporary ponds and pools. And when those pools go down, they go up into this, uh, you know, sand hill habitat or, you know, longleaf pine habitat. But what's happening now is with agriculture spreading, with you know more development, and with more of these, um, what do they call it, the, the solar panel fields? They're building oh, yeah. these massive solar panel fields, and they're filling in these you know temporary wetlands and all the habitat for the chicken turtles. So they're getting pushed out. They're getting run over. Um, and it's just something that I've observed. The more I'm in South Georgia and talking with a couple other people, I feel that. I, Maybe not in five years, but in about 10 years, we're going to be looking at their numbers decimated to about what eastern box turtles have been kind of relegated to here now. And um, it'll be, you know, I, I, I see them as maybe one of the next protected species in Georgia because of habitat loss and, and destruction and road mortality. Um, and nobody's really talking about it. They're not as adaptable as the Florida chicken turtles. Uh, Florida chicken turtles are happy to live in any old ditch or pond. Um, eastern chicken turtles, they have a weird... You know, they, they, they have their particular um, lifestyle. They need they need time in water, then they need time on land, and they need to be able to go between the two. And um, they're they're rapidly losing out on on that being able to do that. So awesome. Thank you. I didn't even know that. I had no idea. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, Definitely so an overlooked uh, species for sure. A couple things here because we're up against the clock in terms of time. There's, we're we're flirting with having our longest show of all time um right now uh two two things that we have to do the first one is i'm plugging the uh t-shirts again the podcast t-shirts uh again the show's been around for seven and a half years and we never had a logo or t-shirt uh an actual logo or t-shirt designed for the podcast so we're really excited about that um comes in a bunch of different um sizes colors and styles so be sure to check those out um the last bonfire campaign that we ran, raised a bunch of money that went directly to uh, Terrapin Research um, with our Terrapin Conservation Initiative um, that Chris's wife, Casey, runs. We're really excited about that. And, and thank now you, the, thank you very, very much for that, by the way, from all of us and everybody at the Turtle Room. Everybody really came together on that one, which was amazing. So we're hoping you guys can help us out again. Go ahead, sorry, just want yeah, to say yeah, thank you. Absolutely, and we're trying to be creative, not only in terms of the stuff that we're putting on the shirts, but what it's going to, we want them to, to as much as we can relate to the actual cause that we're trying to, um, you know, raise, raise funds for. So this one would be towards educational programs, which is something that we're really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the first part of our 
tagline for a reason, education, conservation, and survival, because education is something that's really important to us. So um, take a look at those shirts and uh, keep us in mind um, when we're really grateful. And then, uh, Greg, I have one last question. Um, can you tell us about the time that you um, we're, were going through uh, and doing turtle identification work with um, women of the night, we'll say. Women Does that make sense? Night. Women know, of the night. Yeah. As in, yeah, okay, please. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I'm. T- well, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm trying to keep the clean rating as much as we can. <laughs> I'll. I'll tell it as cleanly as I can. There was a guy that lived really close to me where I used to live, and he was um, exporting a lot of a lot of uh, turtles at the time, uh, musk turtles, mud turtles, stuff like that. And um, that he was sort of disabled because he was just in such bad health. Um, so he would basically get these orders from Asia and you know fill them out and so he would just have guys basically drop off turtles at his house and he would pay me to identify are these actually eastern mud turtles or these musk turtles okay i need you to sex them and sort them anything that's healthy goes in here anything that's not healthy goes in here and uh, he would pay me to do that and anything that you know i liked that he wasn't going to ship he let me keep so i ended up with at one point over 200 loggerhead musk turtles and you know a lot of other stuff but um, yeah, so I went over there one time and it was a, it was a lot that somebody had dropped off, uh, I think 600 mud turtles or something. We had to go through all of them. And oddly enough, they were a mix of East, they were supposed to be all Eastern muds, but they were, turns out uh, mud turtles are, a lot of them are actually striped muds without stripes. Um, that's actually beside the point because he had hired a, a stripper to count the, the turtles with me. Um, <laughs> And so he would sit in his chair um, in his bathrobe with his swollen cancer testicles hanging down. And he would, he would berate this poor girl and call her names oh. and tell her she needed to take her shirt off and um, help me count those turtles. And so she would sit there with, you know, I was, I was like, you don't have to take your shirt off. And he's like, tell her to take it, you know, and like, and so we would just sit there and count turtles and we were taking them from a, a box and putting them in different baby pools and he would, you know, call her names and um, yeah, it was, it was bizarre. Um, and uh, you know, that guy's no longer with us. The Georgia DNR was very familiar with him. They have a bunch of funny stories of that guy as well. Um, and the, the funniest thing he ever did though, was he took, I think it was $168,000 from a guy in Asia for turtles, took the money and then never sent him anything. And then the guy wanted his money and he was like, come get me. And then he went and died. <laughs> So wow! To keep that money. Wow! No, holy! No, I don't. Did the guy get him? Is that how he died? Yeah. No, I mean he he didn't die. Like he didn't like send the email and then you know <laughs> he uh, he 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 like kind of slowly died over I think the course of six months to a year. I I didn't really keep in touch with him until the end, and then like right at the very end, he he called me on my phone and said, "I'm about to die. They're going to take me to the hospital so I can die. Do you want my furniture?" <laughs> and he. he the I mean, is that his, here. yeah, as, as, <laughs> weird and gro- as weird and gross as the guy was, he had good furniture, and I got like a whole <laughs> full of tools, and um, I got a bunch of hoop nets that I'd, I've been trying to give to Grover Brown for like two or three years, and I mean, he had, uh, he used to do, um, he was actually a smuggler in the 60s and 70s, and so like he would drive across the border from California to Mexico, and they would drive back, and they would have suits, and they would be filled with parrots. And so they would they would have a thousand a thousand parrots in like a suit that they were wearing and they'd cross back over and they'd sell the parrots. And then he did the same thing with tropical fish down in Central and South America. And then um, he would do it like flying, you know, mammals. I mean, he told me all these smuggling stories and all these crazy stories of doing that stuff in the 60s and 70s. And write the book. Fish and, uh, write the what's book. that? Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, he's he, he was a crazy guy. And um but not do you want the furniture? Not a good guy, but Jeez. that's the title. Do you want the furniture? A book on cancerous yeah. smugglers. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Cancerous smugglers. We were sorting I turtles at, at my house. house. We were sorting turtles at my house from a big rescue. We had to help. Uh, Anthony was trying to get Kevin to do things like that, and I kept telling him, "You dude, you don't have to take your shirt off." You take your shirt off. <laughs> 
<laughs> Take your shirt off. Yeah. You don't need to be here. Anthony what? in a bathrobe. Yeah, he was. He was in a bathrobe with a pipe. Yeah. <laughs> that looks like a box turtle there. All right, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, this is was great. it wow. Randy Quaid in National Lampoons? He looks like that guy. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, this guy looked like a like a really bad Santa. <laughs> like just a big, a way. big mean bad Santa. Oh my god. I'm on my way. Hashtag turtle Clark's balls. Slightly trashier cousin Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Greg. Guys, I can't thank you enough awesome. for coming on. This, yeah, this has been a really good show. Um, learned a lot of things. Had some real good discussions. Sorry to bring it to a, a dark, inappropriate place to end the show, but I had to. I couldn't be kicking myself tomorrow and bring that up um during our first podcast with with greg so greg there's been a long time coming and uh we've known each other like kind of for a really long time known of each other for a really long time so it's it's been nice over the past couple weeks to get to know you more and and look forward to working with you more in the future so thanks everyone for watching uh we're looking forward to the next show and um please be sure to check out the new bonfire campaign for the podcast t-shirt the first podcast t-shirt ever seven seven and a half years in the making thanks one last thing i want to say about the shirt listen last thing all the money that goes to that goes towards educational programs part of that is the podcast so with some of that money we'll be able to increase our equipment and make this better quality for you guys too that's right that's right so thank you guys so much uh in advance and uh, Greg, thank you. You are a wealth of knowledge. You taught us a lot. I really learned something on this show, and I'm going to go look at YouTube videos about alligator snappers all night until I fall asleep. But I don't sleep, so I'll probably be watching them all night. So uh, thank you, guys. Love you, guys. Podcast out. Bye, guys. Deuces.